Bueno, me, quizá mientras se va uniendo todo el mundo, me gustaría hacer unas palabras generales sobre, sobre el proyecto y ya le paso la palabra a Axel y al speaker, que es Sebastián Rojo. Quería simplemente comentaros que esta es la primera, la primera sesión que hacemos de Quantum Spain Research Seminars y la idea es compartir un poco la, la investigación que se está haciendo dentro de, de, de Quantum Spain. Yo soy la, la coordinadora de, del proyecto y eh, la idea es que tendremos un ordenador cuántico pronto en, eh, eh, aquí instalado en el BSC, cuyo acceso va a ser en remoto por parte de la Red Española de Supercomputación. El proyecto tiene muchas, muchas partes, os invito a, a consultar nuestra página web y nuestras redes para tener más información. Y una parte muy importante va a ser pues, el desarrollo de nuevos algoritmos, que para eso estamos aquí. Entonces paso ya la palabra a Axel o a, veo que Manuel Asorey también se ha, se ha presentado y está por aquí. Os dejo la, la reunión a vosotros. Hola a todos. Eh, Manuel, eh, no sé si, si no lo presento yo. Eh, ¿Queréis que habla todo el mundo español? O, o... Eh, eh, ¿Me oís ahora? Sí. Hola, sí, ahora pedimos. Vale. Pues eh, eso iba a preguntar yo. ¿En qué se hace? ¿En qué lenguaje? ¿Todo el mundo habla español ahora? Maybe you bueno. have to ask in English if everybody <laughs> Spanish. Well, okay. So, uh, do you understand Spanish? Or no veo ningún comentario. Your hand if you prefer English. In el in el chat in in the chat they say English better. Yes. Okay, so let's move to English. Well, um, so today we have a, a first seminar of this uh, group, as Alba said, uh, of this working group, and um, is uh, a seminar, uh, research seminar, uh, given by Sebas Roca Gerard, which is a PhD student from the group, Zaragoza uh, group of David Sueco, and he uh, and his collaborators posted uh, on the archive uh, two weeks ago, the paper who will refer to us in this seminar. So let's start. Sorry for this delay. Go go ahead, Sebas. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Manuel. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here. And thanks to the organizers for offering me to open this new cycle of, of seminars. Um, yes, uh, Manuel already did the, the presentation, so I will go straight to to the point uh, today i am going to talk to you about uh, one of the topics that we are working on the most now which is uh, quantum machine learning algorithms and their implementation in, in molecular qubits no? so first i will tell you what a processing unit built from molecules consists of then i will discuss the applications we are working on and finally i will review the directions in which we plan to to continue so starting with our processor let's first talk about why we want to use molecules as qubits as i am sure many of you are well aware a quantum computer is essentially made up of units of information known as qubits which are two level systems that allow us to take advantage of the quantum properties of superposition and entanglement to achieve or, to, or try to at least uh, achieve greater computational power than in the than in the classical case today the implementation of such computers is based on various platforms such as superconducting circuits photons trapped ions solid state uh, spin qubits etc However, our group is working on a different approach using molecular nanomagnets as systems with more than two levels. Because why settle for just two levels? Two level systems usually arise from restricting ourselves to the subspace of a more complex system. So higher dimensional spaces provide a larger capacity to store and process information, which could allow a reduction in circuit complexity. Here, molecular nanomagnets offer a natural multi-level structure to be implemented as, as qubits. They are very interesting candidates as they offer high reproducibility due to their microscopic nature, tunability thanks to the aptness to chemically design them, and 
They provide also promising advantages in terms of scalability in both the number of elements and in their control. An example of such molecule is the ethereum derivative on which our group has recently been working, characterizing its 12 spin levels and analyzing their possible control. This work was recently published in Communication Physics and showed that it is possible to address both nuclear and electronic transitions, offering uh, great versatility as a possible qubit. To control our molecular qubits, we work on coupling them to resonant superconducting circuits. In particular, we collaborate with the Centro de Astrobiología in Madrid, where they design and fabricate LC resonators for which we can tune the resonant frequency to match our spin levels, modifying both their inductance and their capacitance. Furthermore, we can read out our molecules state via dispersive techniques to not demolish the information stored thanks to an auxiliary transmission line. The spectrum for the transmission will change depending on the, on the spin state. Okay, so let's see then how we can implement algorithms in this, in this setup. Although in the following, uh, we'll be talking about single qubit circuits. We are currently working on a blueprint of a universal molecular based processor in which multi qubit circuits will be included. And I hope that it will be available on the, on the archive soon. So one of the most general types of algorithms that can be implemented almost anywhere is the family of variational algorithms. These are hybrid algorithms since they employ a classical processor to, op uh, to optimize sorry, some cost function that we want to minimize, while the heavy lifting, the, the processing itself, is left for the quantum unit. This scheme is employed in a plethora of applications like finding ground states, dynamical simulations, or the one we are interested in in this talk, uh, which is uh, machine learning. So as a first example of a variational algorithm in a work developed by the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, the BSC, they found that a single qubit can be a universal quantum classifier. classifier sorry. So one qubit is enough. The main idea is that we can encode the qubit state in the, in the qubit state, sorry, the data that we want to classify as well as the optimization parameters, the weights and biases in a classical neural network, for example. So each data point generates a state and each class is represented by a reference state. So in the training, once the state of our qubit has been generated, we compute the overlap between this generated state and its corresponding reference state to compute the loss function and then optimize the parameters in the quantum classifier and try to minimize, minimize this, this loss function. Uh, since we are dealing with supervised learning tasks for each data point, we have the data coordinates and the class uh, which it belongs. Uh, then for, for the test, when we have a new data point that we want to classify and to assign a class, we generate its, its state, we generate the quantum state with the parameters that are already optimized from the training. And we compute the overlap between this generated state and all the reference states to see uh, which overlap is the maximum and therefore assign the, the class. We can also add layers to our classifier, also called ANSATs in this in this topic. This will increase the number of parameters to be optimized, and therefore we will add more nonlinearity to the classifier that is expected to capture more complex patterns. So since this was done for single qubits, we wondered if generalizing this to more than two levels could pose any advantage of if we could find any new paradigm to see what happens. So the first step was to see what type of ansatz we could implement in our experimental setup. With monochromatic pulses in the radio frequency domain, we can generate rotations in the XY plane of the two levels involved in the, in the operation. 
the concatenation of uh, this kind of operations results to be a universal set of operations for a single qubit. And we can relate every parameter of the every parameter in the ansatz with the physical parameters of our setup, always keeping in mind the, the implementation of this, this kind of operations. So in a qubit, we have D levels and therefore D minus one transitions to address. Since each operation comprises two parameters, we have a total of two times D minus one parameters per layer in our ansatz. So this allows us to encode in a single shot data data sorry of dimension two times d minus one but we can encode higher dimensions by dividing each point into vectors of, of such dimension and atomizing each layer into sublayers so here we already see that in principle the greater the dimension of our qubit uh, the more dimensions we can uh, encode in a single shot in, in this kind of uh, quantum classifier so, okay, with this, we know that we can generate any state to then be compared with the reference state. But how we define these reference states? If we are working in a classification task with n classes and we have n levels, we can assign each state of the eigenbasis to each class. But what if we have more classes than levels? In the original work, they propose the use of maximally orthogonal states as reference states. In this manner, we can encode more classes in a smaller Hilbert space, paying the price of having less orthogonality between different classes, which could hamper the, the classification process or introduce biases in the, in the classification. And however, in general, finding this configuration is a very <laughs> hard task. Actually, it is related to one of the smells mathematical problems for the next century, which is finding uh, equispaced points on the surface of, of a sphere. In a qubit, we have the equivalence of the Bloch's sphere, but for higher dimensions, our geometrical intuition fails and the problem becomes even harder. So for this, we have developed a genetic algorithm that is able to find the optimal state configurations for different qubit dimensions and number of states. In a genetic algorithm, one starts with a population of individuals. In this case, each individual is a set of states that we want as orthogonal as possible. Then we iterate a process that has its inspiration in biological evolution. Individuals interbreed with a certain probability, becoming parents of new individuals that will subsequently mutate according to another probability. Each individual possesses a fitness that is to be maximized. And on the contrary to the loss function, here we have the, the fitness function. So the individuals that are chosen to be the parents of the next generation are those, are those with the highest fitness. And the final solution is given by the individual with the highest fitness of all. So in our case, the fitness function is chosen to be essentially the, the closeness of the, of the states between each other. So with this, we can obtain pretty good solutions, some even analytical with few generations. Here I show you a couple of examples. For example, in, in the middle, we have the case of a qubit represented by the by the block sphere. So we have the this geometrical intuition uh, for the case of six states and 20. So we have uh, the octahedron and the dodecahedron uh, respectively. No? And then on the right, I show you uh, a result for a qubit of dimension four for different number or different sizes of sets of states. Uh, up to up to 50 and we compare the the result given by the genetic algorithm with different bounds that we find in the in the literature and we confirm that it works pretty well so performing classification tasks with this approach of of using reference states to compare with the generated states by the quantum classifier has one drawback which is the need for quantum state tomography for each state generated. 
Although for a single cutie, this should not be a big issue. We know that full state tomography is a really hard problem. For this, we also explore the option of using variational algorithms to retrieve the, the full state called self-guided quantum tomography. Here we apply a variational circuit to find the, to find the rotation that sends our state to some state that is easy to measure, like any of the states from the agent basis, for example. Essentially, we try to find variationally a change of basis operation. We found that a considerably, sorry, considerable uh, number of iterations are needed to achieve greater, greater than 90% uh, fidelity. Um, to, to take in perspective, to obtain analytically the state of a qubit, we know that three measurements, one for each base, are needed. So this idea requires further refinement in its implementation if it is to be exploited. It is true that to perform full state tomography for a general d-dimensional QDID, it is not at all trivial to find the necessary operations for all the necessary bases. Uh, like in the, in the qubit, for example, in a qubit, we have to use the, the, the Gelman operations and these things. So with this method, there is no need to worry about that. But uh, returning to, to our subject, in classification problems, one of the techniques, techniques that gives the best results is metric learning. It involves sending our data to a feature space where points belonging to the same class are close to each other, while points belonging to other classes are kept away from, from each other. That is, we want the system to learn a, a, a metric. But this is essentially what the, we are doing here in quantum mechanics. The data points that we encode in the in the QDIT are being are being mapped into the Hilbert space as QDIT states. So in this case, the the feature space is the is the Hilbert space. So we seek to map points belonging to the same class to a quantum state that is close to the reference state defined for that class, and as far as possible, uh, that is maximally orthogonal to the other reference states. And also in the literature, there has been some discussion about the way in which you perform this quantum metric learning, okay? So this is either you fix the reference states or also called centers, or you let them as objects to be found uh, along the rest of the of parameters in the optimization process. As we will see now, if you have a method to determine the optimal centers, that as I said before, is not in principle uh, an easy task. We understand that it is better to proceed in the so-called implicit way, since you light the optimization process uh, fixing uh, parameters. So if we start from our loss function, where states are penalized for their remoteness from the corresponding reference state, we can rewrite the function by introducing the following ensembles. On the one hand, we have the ensemble of states belonging to the same class, denoted by rho. And the, on the other hand, we have the pure ensemble of the reference state. So by introducing these two quantities, we can express the cost function as the fidelity between the two ensembles. Then basic tools from quantum information theory allows us to draw relations between the fidelity, which we want to maximize, to minimize, the loss function and the trace distance between the ensembles. As it is to be expected, we find that to maximize the distance between the ensembles of data points belonging to, to different classes, we have this well separated, we have to obtain the farthest possible centers. And this is precisely what we are able to obtain with our genetic algorithm for any configuration of qubit dimension and the number of classes. So these results motivate our choice to work with the implicit method, or so-called implicit method you know, of quantum metric learning. So now I will tell you about two examples of models that we have been working on. First, I will talk about Fisher's IRIS dataset and then about image classification. So the IRIS dataset is the first model that we use mainly as a sanity check because 
It has three classes and four attributes for each point. So this is ideal for a three-level system or Qtlet, as its two transitions allow all attributes to be accommodated in a single shot, and its three levels offer a completely orthogonal set of states to perform the classification. So the, the encoding employed here is that each angle appearing in, in our ANSATS is a linear function of each coordinate of our data point, together with a weight and a bias as parameters to be optimized, like in, in classical neural network fashion. So in this case, we assign the thetas to the petal attributes and the threes to the sepal ones. And we obtain almost perfect results, uh, about the 98%, with only two layers and using 10 elements, only 10 elements of each class in the training. So you, we use 30 data points uh, for, the, for the whole training. We identify that the two points that are misclass misclassified belong to the border between the, the two classes, given by the versicolor and virginica species. So, okay, I think it's... it's not bad. <laughs> so seeing that our first test had been so satisfactory, we decided to see what happened in in other cases or what happens. So one of them, image classification, is the one I want to, to focus on now. Image classification is a much bigger problem, mainly because of the size of our input. A typical image can be of the order of 28 by 28 pixels, which makes a total of 784 features. And this is definitely too big to try brute force re uploading, as in the case of data sets like uh, IRIS. So, here one must resort to dimensionality reduction techniques, such as principal component analysis. But the problem with this is that we lose the spatial correlation of the pixels in the, in the image. So, we lose too much valuable information. And therefore, if we try to use this technique, we need to use dimensions that are still too high for for our problem so we thought that okay since we are dealing with hybrid algorithms like variational algorithms why not take this into the realm of neural networks which is which we know that they work very well with images thus we decided to use a hybrid convolutional network this is composed of first two dimensional layers that act as dimensionality reducers while maintaining the, the spatial correlations. And then we apply our quantum unit to perform the, the final processing. So it is important to note here that we do not train the classical convolutional network and then we add the quantum unit, but we train all together like a single uh, classifier and a single network. So, but uh, we combine both both methods. So to study the effect of the quantum layer, we compare the results between classifying the mean data set of digits, first with only the classical layers, and then using the exact same layers along the, uh, the quantum unit. Again, uh, I, I repeat here that we do not train first the classical unit, and then we add the quantum, but we train all together. So to study, to, to see what happens, we used a training set of 300 samples for each digit from which we took the 80% for actual training and the remaining 20% for validation. And in the first row, and the, the, the first figure that appears in, on the screen, we observe that when the number of digits equals the number of levels, the quantum layer contributes positively to the classification when sufficient layers are added. That is, when sufficient nonlinearity is, is added to the, to the classifier. In the second row, we see that when the full data set is taken, increasing the dimensionality of the qubit, as well as the nonlinearity of the quantum unit with more layers is crucial. For example, take the, the qubit with a single layer, and we can see that it acts as a bottleneck for the for the network. It is not able to process the information that the classical uh, layers are giving to, to it. So as we can see here that as we increase the dimensionality of the qubit, it starts to, uh, to process the information more efficiently. 
uh, starting to match the, the results for for the for the classical for the classical part let's say um, it is important to note the sensibility to initial conditions here whereas for the only classical network which is the the black line we can obtain a mean value and a standard devi and a standard deviation which is the shaded area the simulations for the quantum part are too long to obtain statistics. So here we present only the, the best results of, of 10 years so far. Also note that we were only able to get to five levels of our QDIT and four layers um, in, in in the number of, uh, of depth of the ANSAT. But you can see by comparing the results between when you have equal number of levels than number of digits, that we have here uh, the the influence of no, non orthogonal states for the for the full data set but as you can see in the first row the the when you add the quantum unit you always even match or in the in the last case you can outperform the best uh, result by by only the classical the classical layer so we can conclude from here that the higher the dimensionality of our qubit the better its performance is expected to be. Also, we have been talking about encoding non-orthogonal states to process the output information. But we could think about using non-orthogonal states to encode the input data, the input data, sorry, instead of relying only in classical routines. In this direction is in which we are moving now, exploring also different data sets, and other problems that are vibrant in machine learning and in variational algorithms in general. So to conclude this talk, I would like to recap the main ideas that I try to, to share with you. First, we have seen that the implementation of variational algorithms in molecular nanomagnets is perfectly feasible with the approach shown here. We think that this approach is also versatile enough to be implemented in many other platforms as it relays in very basic principles and about one of the initial questions we have checked that indeed increasing the dimensionality of our information unit helps to process more efficiently information and that we have very exciting work ahead of us to see where we are able to, to reach. So thank you to all of you for, for your attention and especially to Juan, Fernando and David for the collaboration and the, the work in, in these projects. So thanks also to the different entities for their support and funding and especially to Quantum Spain for allowing me to tell you about our work here. So thank you very much. Okay, the presentation is open for discussion. Is there any question? I don't see any on the chat. I will open the chat. I, I have one question. Maybe I can yes. start. I, I, okay. don't see, I don't see where is the raising hand right now. So. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you for your talk. It was really nice and instructive and interesting at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I have a question about how to, how would you like to continue this work in a sense of, did you, are you thinking about expanding it to multi uh classifiers? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe that is one of the most like obvious direction. No, like to see where. Okay, well, uh, we have we have seen already that a like, single qubit is is, uh, is a good tool. We have seen that increasing the, the number of levels is also uh, a nice approach. So, what happens if we increase this increase this number of levels by by adding more qubits? Yeah, this is a possibility, but um, the, the the first idea that we are working right now is to uh, pop, 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 here, to explore uh, first uh, using a single qubit. What happens if we encode uh, more high dimensional data data? Sorry, using these non orthogonal states in in the input to try to to not rely so much in, in, in classical techniques like PCA or neural networks and, and to see what happens. And also to explore was, um, different problems in, in machine learning, like unsupervised learning, like the salesman problem or different things that, that are also very interesting. And to see what how a single queue works uh, before 
going to, to more to more qubits. Okay, uh, thanks. And and maybe I have a very short follow up question. Uh, so, did you uh, think about comparing maybe in the in the future, like mm -hmm. multi qubit classifier with QD classifier or the same yes. dimension? For instance, uh, a QQuart has dimension four, which mm -hmm. is equivalent of two qubits. Mm -hmm. So, to see if there are differences between using a D level system versus uh, whatever uh, number of qubits uh, equivalency uh, in classification. Yes, for sure. Also, it, it will be. I think it will be very interesting uh, thinking also about the, the implementation to see if the as, as we know the non-local gates usually are. Uh, I think that uh, who is this? Sorry, that uh, has a lot of noise. So it will be interesting to compare if reducing everything to a single unit and you know, using only local operations could be a, a measurable advantage. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question or comment? May I? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I have a question more mm -hmm. uh, a bit experimental. So if yes. you cannot answer but someone <laughs> else Which it's on this molecular qubits yes. whether you can or even if it makes sense to in a qubit system mm -hmm. whether with a single operation whatever that means in experiment mm -hmm. you can entangle say um, well first if you have uh, say only one qubit whether you can entangle the different uh, or make a superposition of the different stage in the qubit with say a single operation um so for example in a qubit um, mm -hmm. you can uh, rotate and be in, in mm -hmm. any place in the in the sphere and whether that happens in a qubit or you at the end do say to uh, treat it like a qubit this is for one qubit and if you have these qubits the same if you can entangle all the stage with a two qubit operation or you end up doing say decomposing everything in qubits yes well uh, something for the single qubit uh, the the kind of oper it depends on what you can do experimentally for example if you can only do monochromatic pulses uh, that is you can only address one resonant frequency at, at, at the time you can uh, the operations that you can do involve only two levels, but you can uh, generate superposition between all the D levels in our QD by concatenating, by uh, doing like a sequence of rotations between uh, adjacent uh, levels. So you end up with a, a full unitary decomposed in, in a sequence of rotations that generate, a, for example, a, uh, homogeneous superposition of all all the all the levels or whatever you want to do, and for the for the multi qubit case, yes, uh, the we are working in a right now in a in a draft that will I, I hope it will be soon on on the archive uh, where we use uh, multi qubit circuits, uh, specifically controlled phase gates and and there yes you can well, also in this in this work the uh, alvaro a collaborator of the of the group uh, show that you can entangle qubits using a, a multi multi qubit gate yes there are two more questions uh, mariano yeah. musa thank you mm -hmm. axel did you finish yes yes just uh, saying thank you Okay. Mariano Musa, mm -hmm. can you open the microphone and ask a question to Sebas? Well, if not, Sergi Masot has another question. Sergi. Uh, yeah, I, I can read it. Uh, so my question was, you did the comparison between the hybrid algorithm with the last part was the quantum qubits. Yes, and uh, a usual neural network, and I'm not sure if there was something to substitute the quantum part that you put there. So for the classical case, uh, were there like more layers of the neural network? Was there somewhere else? Uh, like, like, yeah, yeah. Here, no. Uh, actually, uh, for the classical part, 
we have some uh, two dimensional layers and then one linear layer. Uh, I think it's one, yes. One linear layer uh, that uh, finally comprises all the, all the parameters that are then sent to the, to the QDIT. But uh, to, for the comparison, uh, what we did is the, that the last layer, the last linear layer, uh, its output is uh, is the is the actual uh, prediction for the class. Okay. So it's, so in, it's in this exactly case, would, the same. Yeah. So the quantum part would just be added at the end. Yes. Uh, compared it's to not a, adding anything. Okay. It's, it's the uh, another layer. You okay. can think it as an, an, another layer. Yes. Thank you. Well, Mariano, are you now ready to read your Yes, can you, can you hear me? Yes, yes perfectly. now yes. Okay, so thank you for the nice talk. I'm mm -hmm. interested in, in the genetical algorithm okay. uh, in, the muta in the mutation process, well, I'm reading, where each individual is a different state. Do you have yes. an, expression, an expression for that mutant or how do you do it? Yes, well, and in this, yeah, sorry. Good day, good day. Yeah, and the proce process of the optimization, where do you uh, implement that mutation? Okay, so essentially in, in a genetic algorithm, both the, the crossover for, for the parents and the mutation for the, for the new individuals is something completely arbitrary and you can, you can define those operations as, as you wish. In our case, um, for the mutation, if I am not mistaken, the, the, the exact operation is uh, at random modifying some coefficients of the wave function and then renormalizing the the wave function the wave function. Uh, so I think from we we take the set of states, mm -hmm. we choose at random a number, an integer number, which is the number of states inside that, that set that we want to mutate. Yes. And then we uh, we, we draw another integer number that uh, says how many coefficients from the wave function we modify, and then we modify them uh, at, at random, and then we renormalize so, so everything stays in place with norm one. Um, and the implementation itself is purely, is purely classic. Uh, we, we do so with, with Python. I don't know if it, that's exactly... And and asking. sorry, and then you and then you introduce it in the cost function, or it is half before after. Ah, the, the mutation you yeah. say yes it is um. So we have a uh, initial set of uh, initial population. Uh -huh. We compute the fitness of all of them. Yes. We then proceed with the interbreeding uh, according to this fitness. Okay. We then mutate. And after everything, we again compute the, the fitness of everything to select the new parent. So the, the mutation is just the last step before starting the new. Uh, and then if it, if it is improved, you re, uh, replace it or not? Uh, yeah, if the mutation is, if the mutation worse, uh, worse than the, the, the fitness, Mm -hmm. that individual will not be chosen as parent for the next generation but we we let it uh, like it is okay 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 thank you thanks Steve. is there any other question or comment i don't see any on the chat but perhaps still time for one more question Yes, uh, hello. I also have a question. So um, regarding the data sets that you are thinking to use later on, for example, like the cancer data set, and, yes. um, then I, as far as I understand, there you have more um, data to a code, right? Will this be a problem or? Yes, or... We, one, one of, the, of the points that we want to address with more data sets is to explore the different combinations of input dimension and output dimension. So how we manage the different input dimensions, how we manage different formats, let's say, of the of the data and the different uh, outputs, you know, the number of classes that we have to, to handle in each data point. 
So to see if we need to add more layers to the ansatz, like for doing this re-uploading to accommodate more dimensions in more, yes, more dimensions in the input data, uh, to see if it is too big to do that and we have to think about other methods like hybrid convolutional networks or maybe this encoding in maximally orthogonal states. Uh, but yes, it's just to test the, all the different combinations that we can face. Okay, yeah, see, thanks. Thanks. Any other question? Well, if not, I would like to tell you that this is the first seminar. Thank you, Sebas. Thank you very a much. series of seminars we are uh, trying to implement on this platform. And if uh, somebody is interested in giving another research seminar, uh, it will be interesting to hear. And please um, contact me at my email address, which is asorei at unizar.es. This is on the chat. You can see the email address. Okay, it's now written by Paz, Maria Paz. Thank you. And uh, if no more questions, so we close this first seminar. And thank you once more to Sebas for his excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you for your attention.